Well, here we are, getting all fancy with the stream yards. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome one and welcome all to the Junk Shop Library channel. And to, I'm sorry, we're getting just a little bit of echo, sweetheart. I'm not hearing an echo. I can hear myself on your phone, clear as day. It's all right. We're all... We're all learning with the technology, okay. are we all? <laughs> it's all right. Uh, we should have done a test setup of this at uh, some point earlier in the week, and my organized self just flat forgot. Welcome, one and all, to the Junk Shop Library channel and to Mental Health Thursdays, where we talk about a variety of uh, mental health topics and have a variety of streams and uh, started most recently with a bit of tea in Danish, uh, beginning a variety of guests. My guest today, add to stream, I think I've got the right button, is Mr. Paul Kamish. Hello, all everybody. All the way from the UK. How you doing today, Paul? Yeah, I'm doing very well, thank you. It's only tea. <laughs> coffee over here. Yeah. You and your coffee. What you Me like. Me and my coffee. <laughs> <sighs> All righty. Well, we've got a multitude of folks in the chat. So many and talking so fast that, quite honestly, I'm not going to try to shout you all out by name right now. Y'all know who you are. Thank you for being here. I do have to take just a moment at the start of the stream to thank my fantastic patrons. You see their names scrolling across the bottom in the green. Um, these folks are the lifeblood of the channel and help me continue to do all of the various things that I love to do here. Uh, in alphabetical order, Atheist Pastor, Aunt Jur, B, Bill, Brain Bug, Mark Caesar, Paul Kamish, Gary, Ilya Moon, Kim, Linda, The Lone Wanderer, Matt Pig, Mama Atheist, Nikki, Rain, and Santi. Thank you all, one and all, so very, very much. All right. Well, we are here today to talk about a very, very important mental health topic, uh, as you know, is PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and Paul has come prepared with a short video clip explaining PTSD, which we're going to start off with before we launch into our discussion. And if I have done this correctly, I should be able to just pop this up alongside us. Can you just let me know when you've got that on your screen and then I can uh, press the play? All right. I'm seeing it up on mine. Right. I'll press play now then. All right. Have you or someone you love ever been in a tornado or car accident, experienced sexual or physical abuse, served in a war zone? Most people have been through some kind of life-threatening or traumatic event, and it's common to have stress-related reactions after a trauma. But when symptoms last more than three months and are not getting better, it's time to get help. Meet Sam. He recently returned from serving in Iraq. For many people, being in a crowded place like a baseball stadium or a busy grocery store feels comfortable, but not for Sam. What should be a nice night out, taking his wife Tara to a restaurant, isn't fun for him anymore. He can only handle it if he sits with his back to the wall where he has a good view of the exits, and even then, he's too on edge to really enjoy it. At home, things aren't the way they used to be either. His sleep is restless at best, and some nights Tara isn't sure if Sam comes to bed at all. Sam seems to have a short fuse these days, and sometimes he snaps at Tara over tiny misunderstandings. 
What he and Terran never talk about is the trauma he experienced when he was deployed. He's never mentioned the guilt, the weight he carries around, wishing he could have done more to prevent what happened. Instead, he's turned inward, pulling away from family and friends. Tara tried to give him some space, but after months passing without change, she really started to worry. She was the one to finally say what they were both thinking. It's time to get help. That's when Sam finally decided to take action. He reached out to a doctor who told him about PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Sam's symptoms were getting in the way of enjoying his life, re-experiencing, hyperarousal, feeling worse about yourself or the world, and avoidance are the four types of symptoms people with PTSD have. Sam's doctor explained each. The first is reliving the event, or re-experiencing. This is often an unwanted memory or even a flashback where you feel like you're right back in the situation again. Seeing, hearing, or even smelling something that reminds you of the trauma can trigger these. Nightmares where you relive parts of the event in your sleep are common too. The second is avoidance. Staying away from situations that remind you of the trauma. That's why Sam tries to avoid thinking about painful memories altogether. He pours himself into his work or uses alcohol to keep his mind from going back to the trauma. The third is feeling worse about yourself or the world since the trauma. You might feel overwhelming guilt like Sam or not trust anyone. You just might not be able to feel happy, even when you are around people you love. The fourth type of symptom is sudden rushes of anger, irritability, feeling jittery, always on alert, always on the lookout for danger. This is called hyperarousal and loud noises or a driver cutting in front of you can be all it takes to set you off. If you recognize any of these symptoms of PTSD in yourself or someone you love, don't wait. See your doctor to find out if it could be PTSD. Just like Sam and Tara found, there is hope. You don't have to live with the symptoms of PTSD forever. Effective treatments are available. To learn more about PTSD or how to get help, Visit the National Center for PTSD website at www.ptsd.va.gov. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you for that. That was, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, that video explains very well about what PTSD is. And I think we should start off by saying that in no way, I mean, uh, junk shops, um, medical professionals, we're not here to give you advice on PTSD. If you suspect you've got PTSD, the very first people you should speak to are the medical professionals. We're here mainly to highlight um, PTSD and basically, as this um, stream is, is to end the stigma. Because that's a problem with a lot of mental health illnesses. Uh, we can fix the body, uh, broken bones and stuff like that. We can cure diseases and stuff like that. And I think one of the, the least um, treatable, or what seems to be the least treatable, is, is mental illness in, in any form. I think the medical profession hasn't progressed on that as much as it has on other things. Like I say, like I say broken bodies or... Um, or illnesses and stuff like that. And one of the main reasons I think people don't come forward is the stigma. They feel embarrassed about having some sort of a mental illness and it stops them coming forward about it. And that's what we need to, to fix first. Once we can fix that, then we can fix the people. If people stay quiet and, and try and hide away from all this, all it's going to do is get worse without treatment. It's not gonna get better. So my advice to anybody out there, if you feel that you suffer from any mental illness, be it PTSD or any of the other ones, the first part of call is a medical professional. I just think we should say that because we, I don't want people coming on here thinking we're experts on it. I don't suffer from PTSD. I have friends that have PTSD. That's why I wanted to come on this when um, when Junk Shop was doing the Mental Health Thursday and he wanted guests to come on. I thought, well, I, PTSD is, cl is close to my heart. Um, I was in the military for 15 years, so a lot of the people that I know suffer from PTSD. And and I was very ignorant on on PTSD. I don't believe that it had really been mentioned. I left in two, the year 2000. There, there wasn't a lot mentioned about PTSD or mental uh, illness. It was later on after I'd left. And obviously, I've got a lot of friends on Facebook that are ex-military. Some of them did were, were in the military the same time that I was. And 
that it was coming up that some of these people were suffering from uh, from PTSD. And I'd look back on my career and think, well, they served the same time as me. They, they did virtually the same as what I did. I don't have PTSD. And I've got to say, I was guilty on thinking, is this just all in the red? Is this just an excuse or, or whatever? Because I was totally ignorant from it. Now, my limited understanding of PTSD, uh, it can affect anybody. We associate it with um, military personnel, uh, first responders, and people like that. But anybody can get PTSD. Uh, being involved in a, a car accident, sexual assault when he was younger or, or even older, any type of sexual assault, um, any type of violence that happens to you. It can also be an accumulation of things. It doesn't necessarily have to be one specific thing. So, for instance, um, being in the, in the army, it could be different stages throughout your army career that all build up. The way I look at it um, is imagine your brain. Um, inside your brain, you've got all these different um, drawers that will have um, happy memories, sad, sad memories, um, memories from your childhood, um, things that you do at school. You've got all these drawers that all these things go into. And you've also got a, a drawer, which is like for where all the trauma happens, and they all go into that drawer. Now, if you've got an accumulation of all this trauma throughout your life, you might have had a, a bad childhood, you might have um, had some sort of assault in your younger years, you then join the military and you've got all the military things that are going on here that you then go on to different careers, you might join the police force, the ambulance brigade or whatever. At some point, with all these different traumas going in, eventually the drawer gets full and, uh, and spills out and ends up in all the other drawers. So things that would normally make you happy like it said in that video, might not you might not be happy when you're around people that, and, and and supposedly you should be having a happy time, there might be a party, and you can't relax. Because all these um, uh, stresses from all these different incidents have happened throughout your life are spilled over into your normal life. It's not just kept away in that little drawer, if that makes sense. That's how I try to understand it. I'm not saying that's a, a medical diagnosis type thing. It's just the way that I find it easier to understand when somebody's got um, PTSD or any other mental illnesses, but mainly the PTSD one, I think of it as draws. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine on, I think it was Tuesday night, we had a, um, a chat on StreamYard, we didn't go live. So we had a, a chat and he has PTSD. He was in the army at this, roughly about the same time as, as me. I think he left in about 2000, I left in 2001. So he did his, uh, his time in the army. So. He, Pretty much our experience in the army would have been pretty similar. Uh, he then went on and joined the fire brigade. So, of course, you can imagine all the type of things that he'd seen in the fire, in the fire brigade. He told me a few stories. And slowly, all these things built up. And um, he, he now has PTSD. Luckily enough, it's not really bad. I don't think he's taking any sort of medication sort of treatment. And he's got it under control. Uh, and one of the main things he did was seek medical advice and he um he went on a program which is cognitive behavioral therapy which he found uh helped helped him uh what was the cognitive behavioral therapy and one of the stories he was telling me again he hasn't put it down to one specific thing it's a combination of all all of them his amish career his time in the uh the military now if you how he explained it again to me was if you look at in the military we run towards danger we're not running away from it while everybody else is running away you're running towards it so he had uh, i think he did about 12 years so he had 10 12 years of uh of, of doing that he then joined the fire brigade and of course with the fire brigade they're one of the first people on site so they're not just dealing with fires they're dealing with road traffic accidents they're, they're going into danger and they're seeing all these horrific things and eventually something has to snap and uh, unfortunately, it did with him. He was telling me one of the stories. He was on call uh, one night, I believe he was on call from, say, six o'clock at night. His wife was at work, but she was due home um, before he was due to go to, uh, well, before he was due to be on call so that he could use her car or use the, the family car uh, should there be a call out. Unfortunately, that night there was a call out at five past six. She was due home at six o'clock. She hadn't arrived home. And at five past six, she got a call out. So he had to, to drop everything jump on his, his bike and, and bike to the fire, fire station 
And when he got to the fire station, they found out that it was an accident. Well, he, he asked when he got to the fire station, is the accident on the A64? Uh, and he was told yes, and that's the route that his wife takes home. So, of course, this now builds him with fear that think, I could be going to the accident, and, you know, and it could involve my wife. Um, he gets to the scene. I believe it was some sort of a coach crash, or it was a bad accident anyway. And basically, when he got to the scene, all he could think about was looking to see whether he could see the family car. And he, he, he was telling me he was stepping over basically dead bodies in the road to, to look to see whether it was car before he could actually carry on and do the job that he was supposed to do. Uh, it was focused on trying to see whether the, the wife's car was there. Luckily, it wasn't, and she wasn't involved in it. Um, she, would, she, she was at home. I believe she texted him to say that she'd got home, so then he could deal with the situation. Now, you can imagine that all that all accumulated together. Eventually, something broke, and he took the correct um, action and took medical advice. And now he's got it. He was telling me the other night he's, he's actually got it under control. I believe he had a bit of a, a relapse about um, a year or 18 months ago, but he's, he, he, it was only a slight relapse. And what happens, I believe, is uh, like that video said, and I, it struck quite quite a lot with me, that video, because you were saying that the, um, the guy, he can't stand crowded places. I can't stand crowded places. The wife knows when we go to go shopping, uh, we can be in the, like this, the shopping precinct, the shopping mall. And if it's really busy, I, I stop shopping. I stand outside the shops uh, and I'm stood against the, the window of the shop and the wife will come up and she go, you've had enough, haven't you? I went, yeah, I said, I need to get out of here. It's not that I've got any fear or anything. I just cannot stand um, being in a crowded place. And also, if I go into a, a, a new place I've never been to before, one of the very first things I do, I know where all the exits are. That's one of the first things I do whenever I go into a new place is I find out where all the exits are. If I'm out in restaurants or uh, at the pub or anything like that, I do the same thing as what that guy said. I sit with my back against the wall. I don't like being in a crowded place where there's lots of people behind me because I can't see who they are or what they're doing. If I've got my back against the wall, I can observe everybody. And I'm a generally, I'm a people watcher anyway. I'm always watching what people are up to, what they're doing. I can spot... Um, the wife says it all the time we can be in a pub and five ten minutes before anything kicks off i can say there's trouble over there i can spot it a mile off trouble um but as i say i don't suffer from ptsd i think that probably boils down to a lot of your um the military training especially having your back against the back against the wall um looking for exits it's one of the things you, you're taught anyway especially in northern ireland when you're searching for bombs and and stuff like that and shopping malls and what have you. you you need to know where the exits are plus you need to get people out so you need to know where the exits are and i think that sort of training sort of sticks sticks with you it's got nothing whatsoever to do with um with ptsd i i don't feel it does because i don't feel like that. i suffer from ptsd i have no problem sleeping or i don't get flashbacks um, there was another story I was going to tell you as well. Again, these things can all, but all build up over a period of time. It was saying in that that in one of the videos that I'd watched that younger people or children don't tend to suffer it as, as much, and I think it's something that's more in a later later life as you get older. If you've had traumatic things in your past, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to suffer from PTSD several weeks after. The, the incidents it can be years afterwards and i can quite understand that when i was younger and when most most men are young, younger they're full of the testosterone and they think they're invincible and uh, that's why that's why uh, you know lads in themselves more than generally girls, girls do we, we seem to think that we're invincible and, and this story that i've got for you is i would have been about 13 14 year old and I live on the uh, the coast, so we've got the cliffs that go on the, the coast. And one of the things that a lot of the local lads do is we go collecting gull eggs, sea gull eggs, and you can make omelettes out of them. They make brilliant uh, omelettes. Um, so this has been in late 70s. I'm there with a friend a friend of mine. Uh, I'll tell you his name, uh, Derek Califax, uh, a school friend of mine. We were out on the cliff, and we decided to go collecting gull eggs. So I climbed down the cliff. And now this cliff is 250 foot high. And it is literally straight down. There's no sliding down the cliff. It's you lose it, you're going 250 foot down uh, into rocks. 
as a, as a 13, 14 year old kid, the fear just wasn't there with me. So I climbs over the top of the cliff and I'm literally going along the side of the cliff, getting to a uh, nest, grabbing an egg out, passing them up to him. So we've got several eggs. I'm now coming back up the cliff. So I've got my hand at the top and it's like a grassed uh, edge. As I got hold of the grass, the grass pulled away and I started to fall backwards. And as I, he was laid on his belly because I was passing him the eggs, and as I started to fall backwards, he reached out, grabbed me, pulled me back, and I climbed back up. We we laughed about it, but now if I'm if I am if I go, when I go to bed, sometimes you know you're thinking about your past and what you did as a kid, you know, and you can't get to sleep. When that memory comes into my mind, I can't get to sleep because I think how close was I to that happening? You know, to, to actually going over. It, it, it literally, the guy actually did save my life. If he hadn't grabbed me when he did, I would have gone 250 50 foot down. So, yeah, that thing sticks in my mind. Um, there's little things in the army that stick in your mind. I was in Northern Ireland. I was in um, Londonderry. I was in Rosemount, our IUC station, and we came under attack one night. Uh, we had, um, there was an hand grenade thrown over, and we also took in um, small arms fire shooting at us. About five minutes no more than five minutes before this incident had happened there was a little shop inside the little IOC base i've been to the little shop and i'd walked past, uh, back i've literally just got into into um, into the room when everything kicked off again it didn't bother me at the time it was more like an excitement thing and um anyway in the morning basically this hand grenade that had been thrown over it didn't go off it, it failed to go off because it was it was late at night. Well, not late at night, but it was dark. Um, nobody had seen the hand grenade, so it sat there all night. And I think it was found um, in the morning. And it was literally where I'd walked past. So, if, literally five minutes previous to that, if the hand grenade had gone off, I could quite easily have been walking past as the grenade had gone over. At the time, never thought about it. Think about them little things now. I, it does sort of like stick in my mind. I think mm, that was a bit close, a bit <laughs> closer than I would have liked it to be. And again, I, th I believe all them little things could possibly eventually build up and build up and build up and build up. And I could suffer from PTSD and it could be something from, like I say, years ago. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that happened um, six months ago. You could suffer from PTSD, start suffering from the symptoms of PTSD next week. And it could literally be something that happened to you 20, year 20 30 years ago. Because I think what happens is when you get older, you realise you're not invincible uh, and maybe sometimes you might think back to, to instances and there might be a few incidences where it was quite close <laughs> generally it probably wouldn't affect the majority of people but like the friend of mine uh, brian when it when he had it he's got all big things in his life that he's seen throughout the fire brigade and his military military career and that all built up and uh, he ended up with uh, he's now he now has ptsd but luckily it's not severe and has got it under general control, I believe. So, I mean, that's about as far as I can uh, go with the, the stories that I've I've got. So I don't know if there's any questions in the chat or anybody, anyone wants to ask that we might be able to answer. Scroll real quick and see if there's... I don't know if Brian's in. I know he's on duty tonight because he's still in the fire brigade. He said he would try and... Uh, uh, watch it so I don't know if he's there if, if Brian if you are out there and you're in the chat just jump in and say hi uh, I do want to reiterate just for the record uh, what Paul said earlier neither one of us is a is a medical professional these are all layman's perspectives and, and layperson's opinions uh, so do um, as as Paul did mention if you if you think that you're uh, that you could be suffering from PTSD, perhaps even if you're at, if you believe yourself to be at risk for PTSD, mm. do reach out to uh, to psychological professionals. There there is help out there. Uh, the video we watched at the beginning was produced by uh, the VA, and there are mental health. Uh, avenues available there um as i suppose there are for for veterans in in most countries yes there is yeah so yeah. 
But the, uh, let's say the, the the best part of call first would be um, your, your doctor. That would be the um, go, go see go see the doctor, uh, and they will be able to put you in touch with all these different um, uh, health groups and stuff like that as well. Yes. But, uh, our our main point in this video really is um, is to to highlight these mental illnesses and like the. Uh, the banner says is to end, to end the stigma because I do think that that is the most important thing that we need to get rid of is the stigma because once we can get rid of that we can start treating people if people feel uh, embarrassed about coming forward with any sort of mental health illnesses we, we, you can't treat them anyway no matter how, no matter how good the uh, the the, uh, the medical profession might be in treating that particular um, uh, mental illness that you've got they can't treat you unless you come forward so the most yes. important the most important thing to do is to come forward and um if you don't want to go straight to the medical professional straight away speak to friends speak to your uh, to family explain to people how you're feeling because i think one of the main things that can can help people is just to talk about it if you've got some sort of um uh, a stress type thing and you just you, you've always got things on your mind you're thinking all the time and all the time it's like they say a, a problem shared is a problem uh halved, and i do but i do believe that that if you, you talk about it and, and be quite open about um, PTSD or anything like that, um, it's probably one of the best things you can do is to talk about it and then go, like I say, get medical uh, medical help. Agreed. Because I think as well, this is um, it's like any illness. The longer you leave it, um, the worse it the worse it's going to get. It's going to get more and more ingrained into you. Um, it's like if your if your behaviour is starting to change and um, you're, you're stressed all the time all the time it'll become i suppose almost like a, a muscle memory it'll become a normal way of life for you to always have these uh, thoughts or to always react in a certain way uh, and like i say it's going to end up like a muscle memory so it's going to be harder um for you to try and get back to um some sort of norm normality whereas if you come forward at the very early stages it's like any sort of illness the sooner that it can be treated the um the better the treatment will, will be. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question here in the chat that ties nicely into that. Uh, Lone Wanderer asks, uh, do you think that PTSD can be cured? Uh, it, it, would, it would depend on the, on the person, I suppose, as well, uh, and, and how bad the, the PTSD is. I would I would have thought. Um, yeah, I suppose it's like any illness; it's going to have some sort of a success rate. Uh, in most cases, I would I would like to think that it, it it could be cured or or even controlled. But even if it can't be cu uh, cured, there might be uh, certain triggers that you might get that will warn you when these uh, anxiety feelings are going to come ahead. Um, so you might be able to predict uh, and probably avoid certain situations. Uh, again, if you're suffering from from PTSD, you will you will hopefully be able to recognise that certain situations um, put you in a more vulnerable position. So you'll probably have to avoid them um, them situations uh, if if PTSD can't be. Taught. Well, I wouldn't have thought PTSD would be able to be totally cured because I suppose it's it's a memory. You're always going to have the memory. Um, the memory is always going to be there. It's going to be a way of controlling that, trying to control um, the, the memory, so that it it isn't always coming to the to the front of your uh, your thoughts all the time. Uh, and I believe some of the um, the cognitive um, behavioural therapy. One of the things I suppose would be to put you into controlled situations where you will try to to learn to um, to control. Um, them feelings. So, if, if if crowded places, for instance, is something that um, you can't handle, going to say supermarkets. So you can't handle being in the the, the crowded um, supermarkets. If you've got a supermarket near you that's open, say twenty four hours a day, it might be an idea to, to go to that supermarket at two o'clock in the morning when it's when it's quiet and get your shopping done then, and probably go with a partner or a friend. Uh, and then the next time you go go a little bit later a little bit later until you, you're going in early hours well after after breakfast time so say um nine ten o'clock in the morning where there's going to be a few more people around until in the end you can build it up so you're going in the, at the busy times 
uh, and then eventually you will probably be able to um, to do that without actually taking a friend or partner with you. It w it would all depend on the in the individual. Yeah. Um, there was a comment earlier that does link into that. I love how organic this is going. The conversation here and in the chat. Um, Julie says she knows uh, two women with complex PTSD from an amalgamation of violent events most years apart. And that uh, that sort of ties back into what you were talking about earlier with the metaphor of the drawers, yes. uh, which I'd never heard. And I, I quite like that. Well, it was you know, something, I, I don't know whether it's, it's just something, I, the way I, I, I use it, um, most memories, you think back to your childhood, most, most memories, uh, memories seem to, to fade eventually. Um, when you look back at your childhood, it's like main events that you can uh, remember. So you might remember going on holiday when you was a child. You might remember uh, a particular birthday. You won't remember all your birthdays. You, there might be particular birthdays that you remember or certain instances at school that tend to tend to fade. So I think what what would happen is, is uh, that they'll go into uh, a certain drawer in your brain, which... Every time you bring them out, um, you'll, re you'll relive them and it'll enforce that memory. Um, and if you've had a traumatic experience in, in your life and, like I say, that drawer that gets uh, full and starts spilling over, when you start thinking about these happy um, thoughts from when your childhood or any other part of your life which is happy, suddenly that memory of what happened uh, a couple of years ago or six months ago, that traumatic experience, also can be dragged to the forefront as well and i suppose it's a, a way of trying to keep that memory away if your jaw gets full it, it spills out it's just the way i i'm not saying it's uh it's accurate it's just the way that i i envisage it envisage it uh it's a way for me to try and understand uh, a little bit more about ptsd because like i say when i left the uh, the army there was very little if i don't believe anything was mentioned about it, it was something that came up um later on and like I say, a lot of my friends, a lot of friends that I have on uh, on Facebook that I served with, quite a few, suffer from PTSD. And uh, like I say, I was I was thinking, well, why why is this? Why have they got these PTSDs? And it, I suppose it goes to um, Brian, who was speaking to. He left the military, then joined the um, the fire brigade, and I think he's done about. 50, well, he left in 2000 i don't know if you joined the fire brigade then but i think it's done probably going on for 20 years in the fire brigade as well so you add all them up at some point your, your brain just can't take this anymore it's 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 gonna snap and uh, and what he was saying as well that the way that he can think it, it started with him is um his heart rate would start increasing he would start getting hyper vigilant as in looking about thinking something something's going to happen something's going to happen He's trying to find a problem, but he can't. He can't see the problem, but he can, but he can feel that there is a problem. So then, his uh, your body will, will then jump into the uh, fight or flight mode. But you've got nothing to run away from, and you've got nothing to fight. You've got nothing in front of you, but you've got all these feelings. Your heart rate then starts to to increase. So then your brain, your brain starts saying, "Look, there is, there is something wrong. You can you can feel there's something wrong. Your heart's going. You, you might start thinking that." You know, am I going to have an heart attack? And uh, he's got nothing to, to focus on what it is. Uh, and then su suddenly he, he just went into a, a, a meltdown, basically. Yeah, I have a, um, I myself have very, very mild uh, PTSD from a, a solo event. Um, I was, I was watched, I was playing around online uh gosh it was over a year ago now and uh somebody happened to be sharing the live footage from inside the the christchurch massacre as it was going on oh right yeah uh and that was that was uh quite traumatic in the moment mm. i hadn't realized just how traumatic it was until i saw some some footage on the news months and months and months later of an entirely different shooting. Mm. And it, you know, it was the, your typical irresponsible internet news to, to showcase footage like that. Yeah. But as I had had my first flashback 
there mm. in the moment. I was I was right back where I was when I saw the saw the initial incident and could smell the same dinner cooking that was going. It was it was very bizarre mm. experience. Thankfully, that's a, a something I can dodge. I'm a little more careful with my consuming of news now than I was. And I'm not as likely to see that sort of thing. Uh, certainly not in real time, thank God. Yeah. Well, let's say I did, I did 15 years in the, the army and I served in uh, four combat zones. So I did uh, Northern Ireland, Bosnia, Kosovo and Sierra Leone. But I've got no real... Um, traumatic stories to, to to tell little bits and bobs but nothing that i consider at the time that was too bad like i say one of the main one from northern ireland when i was in um, the rosemount ioc station and it came under attack um that's it at the time it, it didn't bother me at all i absolutely wasn't bothered about it but now in my later life like i say sometimes you know when, you, when you're trying to go to sleep and you've got all the memories and you know yeah you're struggling to get to sleep and you start thinking about things suddenly that will come up and you think Ooh, that was a bit close uh, oh i had another incident which one another one that um quite often comes into my memory um i learned to fly gliders as you know i've got me my pilot's license but i started flying gliders uh, in 1999 so i started learning to fly gliders and anyway, this one particular day uh, i turned up and the glider that i normally fly wasn't available so this is all, which is a, what you call a K21, which is a, a fiberglass type um, glider. The only one that was available was a, a K13, which is an old training glider, two seater. Um, but one seat in front of the other. Oh. Um, so this is all, t take the, uh, the K K13, which is a wooden, a wooden framed glider with um, like a, a, a drum type textured over the, over the wings. I've flown it a few times during my training, um, but I always preferred to fly the, um, the K21 because it was more of a modern aircraft. So anyway, I said, the K13 is available, take that. And I said, well, I've never really flown it with, well, well yeah, you went, you've flown it a couple of times. I said, yeah, yeah, I have. And they went, well, take that. And I didn't really want to, and I felt pushed that, to, to take it up. So I jumped in the, um, the glider, off I goes on the winch lawn. It's about 1,500 feet off, off the, uh, the cable. Started flying around a little bit, got back into the circuit. When you get into when you come into the circuit, you want to be in the circuit about a thousand feet. Once you start getting below a thousand feet, you want to get into the into the circuit, which is the uh, the pattern that you fly as you're coming in. Okay. Um, so you're coming on the downwind. So you've got the um, the airfield here, your landing site here, and you come down here, which is which is basically you're flying downwind. So the wind's blowing you down downwind. Then you do a diagonal. Then you basically, like, and then your final turn, turn to come into land. So I was I was flying along I'm at a thousand thousand feet, think right, I'll start getting into the circuit. So I got into the circuit. I'm at a thousand feet, nine fifty, nine hundred feet, eight hundred feet. Start to turn the, the base. Anyway, I must have hit some um, uh, some lift, some um, air currents, and I hadn't noticed my altitude. But when you turn the final base, you want to be at about probably about six hundred feet as you turn the final to come in. As I turned the, the final, I, I looked at my altitude and I'd gone back up to a thousand feet. So I was I was now, now high. So basically, basically what what had happened was as you're coming in, you're looking at the airfield. Uh, and the best way to, to look at it is if you're looking at the, the place where you're landing at, if it stays in the same position on the on the um, canopy, you are basically heading for it. If it starts going underneath you, you're gonna fly over the top of it. If it starts to, to move away from you as you as you're coming in, you're gonna land short. Obviously, with a glider, you can't put the power on and go back on and have another go, which you can do on a, a powered aircraft. You've got to get it right every single time on a glider. So I looked, and I'm at a thousand feet. Oh, bloody hell. Get rid of some uh, some height. You've got air brakes on the a glider, which is basically a spoiler that comes out on the, the wings. On this one, it comes out both sides, so you've got wing in the middle, and these will pop up, and it disrupts the airflow over the wings, reduces the lift, and you start to come down. Now, I was aware that the spoilers on the K13 are really effective compared to the K21. But because it had been a while since I'd flown it and it wasn't really a particular aircraft that I like to fly, as soon as I realised I was too high, I got the air brakes, 
crack crack them open full. Look at looking out the out the window. Think, right, I'm coming down now. I need, I need to really lose some height here. I'm at a thousand feet. I've got to lose some height. So I put full air brakes out. The next second I knew, when I looked out the window, I'm now too low. I closed the air brakes as quick as I could. Everywhere underneath me is trees. There is nowhere to turn to land elsewhere, land in a field or anything like that. The only clear place is straight in front of me and it's starting to disappear. It's going to go, it, it, sorry, it's, it's starting to rise in the, in the canopy. It's going away from me. I'm at about 300 feet at this point. Looking at the pitch out the window, I am not going to make the runway. But I could make the grassed area prior to the runway because obviously you can land on uh, grass as long as it's clear you can land on it i'm looking at that and thinking no i'm going into the trees that's where i'm gonna hit i just instinctively put the nose down that diving towards the ground i'm at 300 feet i'm at probably doing about 55 knots at the time so i put the nose down built up as much speed as i could i probably got to about 80 90 knots so now i'm tanking along but i'm literally about 10 foot above the trees so i put it into level, level flight and i'm going straight now towards the fence because this was on the raf base so i've now got a security fence in front of me and all i can see is this security fence above i'm going straight into the security fence but i've got loads of speed on so i'm in, in level flight the speed slowly starts to come in off so i'm at say like 80 90 knots it's now gets 70 knots it isn't going to stall until it's a long time since I've flown gliders, but it's probably not going to stall until I'm probably about 28 to 30 knots. So I've still got plenty of uh, basically power, which is my speed behind me. As I get just before the fence, and I'm going to power into the into the fence, I pull back on the stick, I go up, over, over the fence, and I must have landed 20 foot from the fence and landed it. The guys all coming over, and because basically where I was, I disappeared out of their view. They didn't know whether I'd hit the fence. They, they didn't have no idea. Next minute, all these guys coming running towards me. I'm just getting out the out the canopy, and they're like, "Are you all right? Are you all right?" So I says, "Fine." I said, "The landing was perfect. It couldn't have been." <laughs> and they went, "How?" They looked at they looked at the glider, looked at the fence, and went, "How the hell did you get that in there?" And I went, "I've got no idea. I, I could never have done it again. It was a, just an absolute fluke." Um, we moved the glider back to the air, airstrip, and the uh, the CFI. The chief final instructor came over and says, "Look, that was my fault. Uh, I pushed you into taking it. You, you didn't want to take it. I should have taken you to for a, a check ride uh, first before you flew it. Um, right. What you need to do now then is uh, go back, do a perfect circuit, and come into land. And I went, I don't want to take it up anymore. And he went, it's like falling off a bike. He says, if you get out the glider now, he says you'll never fly it again. He says you, you've got to stay in it before." What happened basically sticks in your brain. Well, this is what he told me after. He says, you have to get back in it. He said, before that memory of what went wrong got stuck in your mind. He says, because you've never flown it again. So I jumped, you know, well, I literally stayed in the glider. Um, they hooked it up, 1,500 feet. I literally flew, flew around straight into the circuit, back on the circuit. I never, I had one eye all the time on the altitude. Came in, <laughs> did a perfect landing. But now I think back, like I say, you're laid in bed, you can't sleep very well and uh, all these memories start coming back and, and suddenly that'll pop into my mind and I think, how close was that? That was so close. And one of the main things that frightens me about it is my son was on the airfield at the time and he was about eight or nine years old. And I think back to that, I think if, if it had gone wrong I'd, and I either seriously injured myself or killed myself, what, that, what, what would that have done to him? But at the time, it wasn't really something that I thought about. But now it's something that does sort of stick in my mind and think, you know, that was that was too close for comfort. So I've got a few little things that occasionally uh, pop into my mind. <laughs> yeah, just one or two. Sounds just like them, yeah. <laughs> Doc, I think speaks for all of us here and in the chat. <laughs> wow, oh, that that was a hell of a story. Uh, but to be to be honest, I didn't really have time to. Um, I didn't have time to panic, and luckily enough, I, I didn't. I didn't panic at all. Uh, I just, I just looked and thought, "Whoa, you're, you're too low," and I, I slammed the uh, the air brakes back. Um, but it's, it's not a powered airplane. You, you ain't gonna go back up, especially when you're only at about three hundred foot, uh, three hundred feet. And uh, you, you, I looked left and looked right, and it, 
there's just trees underneath me. And I thought, nightmare, I'm going to end up landing into the trees. And this this is probably going to seriously hurt me. Uh, and then, like I say, I just, in, instinctively, I just, I thought, I need speed. I need as much speed as I can get out of this. Um, I can always lose the speed later, but I'm not going to make it. And luckily enough, like I say, I just put the nose down, got as much speed as I could. And I was literally just at the fence. I was almost out. I had enough to literally lift it over the fence and, and down. And the, the landing, it touched the ground perfectly. <laughs> it was amazing. Oh, but that's yeah, it, does, uh, it, it is something that I do think about. And, and that instance that was telling you when I was about 14 and uh, climbed over the cliff and uh, the grass came away from me and I was literally going and he just grabbed me and pulled me back in. And at the time, we, we laughed about it. And it was like, oh, that was close. And we laughed about it. And like now I look at it and think, yeah, it was too close. <laughs> yeah, too close. All right. Well, we've been going uh, right at 45 minutes. Uh, that's about the, the amount of time I like to keep Mental Health Thursdays. It seems to be a good amount of time to for everybody in the chat to chat and to to uh, to talk yeah, and fellowship I, and vent. Do, you do any Sam's final thoughts? Geo Sam's put on. Sounds like the time I tried to swim oh, a yeah. tank. I'd be interested to hear that story. I, yeah, I think we'd all be interested to hear that, that story, would, that would Sam. To, tried to swim a tank. Swim a tank. <laughs> And I love the emoji there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Well, uh, I know you've been working on your channel a little here and there, just a little wee bit. Uh, you got anything coming up you want to tell the folks about? Uh, yes, I am actually. I'm, I'm going to do a... Um, uh, not a, not a debunk as such, uh, a review of, let me get his name right, William Lane Craig. He was, uh, yeah, it was it was on a, a thing where it was, it was answering questions, well, not answering questions, it was debunking um, the best arguments for atheism. So this, this video is the best arguments for atheism. He comes on and then he, he criticises it. But every one of his criticisms, uh, he totally takes it completely out of what was actually said. And I got quite mad actually listening to it and thinking, where, where did he get that from? You know, it, there's, there's one instance I'll uh, I'll say, hopefully it won't spoil it. Um, it was Sam Harris is talking and he's saying about um, uh, in the Bible and religion, controlling what people do, um, who they can sleep with, uh, what they do naked and stuff like this. So what does uh, what does William Craig do? He criticises. Well, I don't think the Bible really does that, but I do think we should have some sort of restriction on uh, on uh, on on sex. I mean, the way he's saying it, that it's perfectly natural, and you know, you could argue that um, paedophilia is perfectly natural. But I think we all would agree that paedophilia uh, is something that we shouldn't be advocating. And I thought, where the hell did he get that from? from? Where, where, yeah. did, where did that come from? And, and it just drove me drove me mad. And and I thought he never even said that we shouldn't have some sort of restrictions on what you, what you can do with other people. And you know, the main thing is consent. Consent, Pe exactly. Whether paedophilia is absolutely perfectly natural or not, the child doesn't have consent. So the answer is no. You ain't allowed to do it. You know, it's yes. completely different to somebody. You know, you, you've got a gay, you know a gay couple, be, be it blokes or, or lesbians. It's two consenting adults. So basically, my answer to that is it got bloody out to do with you, mate. You know. <laughs> Well, it is, isn't it? I mean, two consenting adults has got absolutely nothing to do with me. Agreed. You know, paedophilia, that's got something to do with everybody because that in that that's including uh, some somebody who cannot give consent. And even if they could, could give consent, um, us as a community, uh, we have an age limit. You know, under a certain age, the answer is no, regardless of what the child says anyway. So no consent is available. And... That just drove me mad when I thought I'm gonna have to do something about this. So yeah, I'm gonna have to get some time and um, uh, and try and get some answers together for I think there's 14 altogether. So I'll probably have to do it in two bits. Go for like the first seven, and then probably do a second one and do the uh, uh, the the other seven. And then also, um, I believe in September I've been invited on a um, a program which is uh, the Green Hat interview. 
think that's what one that I might be doing. Yes, indeed. And uh, and also the, the other one that I asked you about, if we could get something set up, which is about the um, uh, LGB, LGBT community. Um, but that would be something that I'd be wanting to try and hopefully do for, for work. I'm part of the uh, what we call a diversity group at work, which covers men mental health, uh, uh, racism. It covers religion as well, and it also covers um, the LGBT community. It's about highlighting that, and I think it'd be quite good rather than getting um, brochures uh, and stuff like that for people to read, which they're not going to read. If I could set up some thought, sort of a um, uh, a chat with people from that community where we could have a chat and they can explain their stories or just explain a little bit more than I could possibly know about the LGBT community. Because I'm talking to people, uh, it would probably encourage um, people at work to watch. You know, watch this. Paul Camish is doing a uh, uh, an interview. People are going to watch it. And hopefully it, we might be able to change people's minds. Uh, and then end the stigma on that as well, or at least hopefully we reduce it. Because again, just what I was talking about earlier, um, it's it's about changing people's um, thinking and about changing people's minds, uh, and especially with the LGBT community. Basically, it's got nothing to do with us. Go back to to my twenties. I probably would have been classed as a homophobic i mean i've never been violent against them or, or give them abuse or anything like that but mentally thinking about it i would I probably be in the uh, homophobic then when you get older and you start thinking that there's nothing wrong with them they want exactly the same as you do they, they want to they want to be happy they want to go to work they want to you know live a, a life the same as everybody else do what what they do and get up to in the bedroom has got absolutely nothing to do with you and and, and i've got i've now got a, a few friends that are um, um are gay we shouldn't be picking our friends from what happens in the bedroom. If so, you know, a straight guy, you know, meets uh, somebody at the pub, uh, is having a chat with him, and he gets on re really well, and they, they have a really good night playing pool or whatever they're, they're doing, having a drink, and then later on he finds out that he's gay. What's what's your problem? It's got nothing to do with him. Yeah. You know, and if he's not gay, you're not going to be starting questioning him about what him and his partner do or what him and his wife do in, in the bedroom. Again, that's got nothing to do with you. So why people choose friends over the bed bedroom activities or why it has to play such a big part in people's thinking is absolutely beyond them. So, yeah, I'd like to get involved in that. Um, anything else coming up? No, I think that's it. Uh, whether I actually um, start some sort of channel myself, I don't know. I'd like to do, but... I'd like to do something probably a bit, a little bit different to what everybody else has uh, has done. You've got your uh, thing with your Bible study. Um, Chris has got the Daily Atheist show. I just don't want to feel like I'm copying what somebody else has, has done. So I'd probably like to take more part in uh, in jumping in on people's streams. I was on um, uh, Grumpy Old Do's um, stream a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I've now been on your stream. I've been on Chris's. Uh, twice. I don't know if you saw that, did you, with the Daily Atheist Morning Show? Yes. He got me right in it, didn't he? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> when he sent me the link to the stream and I read what it was, which was, uh, what was it? Oh, the, it was basically to do with American politics. It was the, um, I thought, what the hell am I <laughs> <laughs> But actually, it did, it did go quite well, actually. It was all right. I enjoyed it. It really did. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Paul, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, thank you for that clip uh, at the beginning. Um, it was was very helpful way to, to kick things off and to summarize things. Yes, yeah, so thank you, you for finding that for us. Hmm. And, and, and before we go, I'd just like mm -hmm. to um, say it again. We are not experts on PTSD. We're not here to try and tell you what you should and shouldn't do and how to treat it. We're here to um, to highlight that this is a problem. We're trying to end the stigma. And our main advice you can take away from this is if you suspect you've got any mental uh, illness whatsoever, don't be embarrassed about it. Go speak to a medical professional. Because the sooner that you can be treated, the sooner you can um, start living 
uh, a much more lo normal life and, and don't let it, it fester. If you if you didn't feel very well, it wouldn't be long before you went to the doctor. And mental illness is the same as any other illness. It's perfectly natural and it isn't anything to be ashamed about. Great. And on that note, we're going to run out of here, y'all. Thank you all so much for joining us here today for Mental Health Thursdays. We will see you again for another Mental Health Thursday same time next week. And as we always say before we head out here on the channel, everybody take care, be safe, and stand against hate. And we'll see you again soon. And it's on a tape. <laughs>